All right. Glad y'all are here with me this morning. I could say anything this morning. I'm on a three-day bender of monster uh, pop tarts and uh, and whew. so yeah. So I could, uh, you know, circumstances are not always under your control, and uh, you know, all our customers at work uh, thought that it would be a good uh, a good couple months to uh, to see how much uh, business they could swamp us with, and we're still afloat, but uh, but bailing. And uh, we had the uh, Fortis uh, student uh, lock-in Friday night. So, and of course, being a, have a reputation as a night owl, I always get uh, uh, you know, t- uh, tagged for that, uh, those events. So, anyway, so uh, I'm trying I'm an experiment right now. I could, uh, I don't know if there's such a thing as sudden onset narcolepsy, but <laughs> if I suddenly just stop moving for a few minutes uh, somebody just come up and uh, just pinch me or, or something <laughs> I was joking I'm sorry all right so the title of my message this morning is says who or subtitled who cares what you think let me uh, let me start with a word of prayer Lord Jesus how we need you Lord give us this day our daily bread For you are the manna that has come down from heaven, Lord. Unless we uh, eat your flesh and and drink of your blood, Lord, there is no life in us. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for being here with us, Lord. We need you desperately. And uh, just ask that you would give me utterance, Lord, as I uh, share uh, with your people this morning. Lord, bless those that are uh, here and bless those that are watching from home uh, or in the car, wherever they are. Uh, that are joining us, and uh, let your word go forth, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There are two foundation principles of human enlightenment. And if you get these wrong, all, all other learning is just grasping at the wind. So here they are. Are you ready? This is for free. There is a God, number one. And number two, you are not him. All right. And with that, I'll close. Uh, uh, Pastor Bill, if you want to come up and uh, dismiss. The, oh, all right. I, I got five and a half more pages. So now yeah, you don't know what font I could be. It could be that large, that large print that uh, uh, Pastor Dave uh, Joyner used to uh, used to read on his on his printout. So, you, you know. So as uh, Bishop Ron was always fond of saying, you deserve a better God than you. Or uh, you deserve a better God than the Dallas Cowboys or there are several variations of that, I think. Truth is objective. Truth exists whether you perceive it or not. It exists outside of you. It's not formed by your thoughts or perceptions. And we have a choice when it comes to truth. We can embrace truth. We can conform to it and let it change us. Or... There's a ladder road that's much more difficult to walk. You can resist truth. Resisting truth is refusing to believe it and put it into practice. And that's a difficult path. It leads to destruction. Jesus put it this way. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. And on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. I love the King James there. Other versions say dust or something like that, but. They don't have the teeth of, uh, of the King James there. So because God's word is unchanging and unmoving, it's like having an anchor in the storm. Without an objective standard, it's not possible to arrive at truth or to have any truth. And that is exactly what has happened to our culture and why you have this uh, language today of my truth and your truth and uh, your lived experience and those things are substituted for any kind of uh, global or overarching uh, principles or, or truth or, or standards. What is it they say about opinions? Every, everybody's, they're like armpits. Everybody's, everybody's got a couple and, and most of them stink. So when it comes to opinions, um, I prefer to go to the word of God because God is trustworthy. Let God be true and every man a liar. 
as I was preparing my notes, I've known what I was going to talk about, uh, the main topic, for, uh, for a while now. Um, but I came across a, a news article this week, if you can call it that, that illustrates the confusion that arises when we get those foundation principles wrong. Uh, this, this is uh, from a, a singer-actress, used to be a, a Disney star. Uh, I've never heard of her, but uh, apparently she's very popular. She, uh, she released this statement. Living in the fourth dimension means existing consciously in both time and space. But for me, it means having conversation that transcends the typical discourse. I want to take this moment to share something very personal with you. Over the past year and a half, I've been doing some healing and self-reflective work. And through the work, I've had the revelation that I identify as non-binary. With that said, I will be officially changing my pronouns to they, them. I feel that this best represents the fluidity I feel in my gender expression and allows me to feel most authentic and true to the person I both know I am and still am discovering. I want to make it clear that I'm still learning and coming into myself and I don't claim to be an expert or a spokesperson. Woo. Yeah, what an interesting confession that is at the end. I don't claim to be an expert. Okay, you don't say. <laughs> uh, there's so much to unpack uh, there or unshovel. Is that, is that a word? Uh, but I'll come back to it. I'll circle back on that. Um, but it brings me to my first bullet point. This world, this world will mess you up. The world, the flesh, and the devil. We have three enemies. The world seeking to corrupt and exploit you. Uh, other people, not only systems of this world, but other people. Um, Seems like misery loves company, right? So, uh, some people want to drag you uh, down with them. Your own flesh, sin, seeks to conquer and possess you. What did, uh, what did God say to Cain in, in the garden? Sin crouches at your door. It desires to have you. You must master it. Uh, and that's how sin is personified. Sin, the Bible says, dwells in our members. And it's seeking to, uh, you know, opportunity. And, of course, the devil seeks to devour you. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we have enemies that are trying to drag us down. We talk about uh, in the church a sin nature. But let me assure you, nothing about sin is natural. Sin is unnatural. It is not normal. It is contrary to you, and it is contrary to God's design. It is contrary to his plan for you as an individual, and sin is contrary to God's plan for us corporately. And with regard to sin, there's two modes by which sin operates, and both have devastating negative consequences. Uh, uh, number one is the sins that we commit. And number two, the sins committed against us. Both can seriously inhibit our faculties our moral compass, our ability to make good judgments. Sin turns victims into victimizers. It fractures our personalities. It creates inside us confusion and stirs up unnatural affections. Why do you think James wrote, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins? I mean, you're talking about a trajectory of sin and death and destruction that is changed and all of the future sins that that person would have committed will never be. So I have an illustration. My dear brother here, Mike Torres, whom I hinted earlier to him that I might use him in an illustration, but I don't think he believed me. Uh, he has a new ride uh, that I was admiring this week. It's a, a VW uh, Ardeon. Is that right? It's pretty sleek. So... Let's say I, take, uh, say I take Mike's Ardeon down to the San Gabriel River in the summer when there's parts that are dry and, and uh, channels all over the place. And let's say I take that vehicle down there and I run it through that dry riverbed, you know, and I'm just bouncing all over the place and having a good old time. What do you think is going to happen to that car? <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think Mike's going to do to me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, broken axles, busted radiator, uh, body damage, you know, busted oil pan, you know, fluids leaking out everywhere. 
But let's say I just keep gunning that motor while it's, while it's still going. It's going to overheat. I'm going to blow gaskets. I'm going to have a cracked head. You know, it's going to, uh, engine's eventually going to seize up and that uh, motor's going to be worthless. And at that point, I'm going to lean out the window and scream at the sky, stupid Volkswagen, you sold me this clunker, right? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that take? I bet if we read through the owner's manual, we'd find that that's a street vehicle designed for, to run on the paved roads of the world, right? <laughs> I bet we'd find that we are supposed to change the oil, rotate the tires, and do all manner of maintenance. I bet if we would read the owner's manual and believe it and the, do the things contained in it, that we could expect years of reliable service out of that vehicle or at least give ourselves the best possible chance at, at that outcome. You see where I'm going with this. So that VW, there's a lot of engineering that went into that car. It is, a, it is a marvel in and of itself. But I would submit to you that if you consider human beings made in the image of God, that there is not a, a more sophisticated, finely tuned engineering marvel anywhere in the, in the world, maybe in the universe, than human beings made in the image of God. And what makes us think that we can operate our lives under hostile and reckless conditions without damaging ourselves, without any impact to our mental and emotional operation? It doesn't make any sense, right? It'd be crazy to think that you could uh, take a machine like that and misuse it and abuse it in such a way. So let's say that you refuse to believe Volkswagen or read their owner's manual. What eventually is going to happen is you're going to start writing a manual of your own. You're sitting in the middle of the San Gabriel, airbag in your face. Three tires on the car, one on the bank. Steam and smoke emanating from under the hood. <laughs> in the rearview mirror, you can see two swimmer slash pedestrians uh, injured and unconscious that you maimed along the way as you bounced down that rocky riverbed. But because you're still clueless and mystified about how you got here and how you arrived in these circumstances, you ponder and you begin the process of healing and self-reflective work and decide that the reason you're in this painful mess is not because of your sin, but because you haven't been allowed to truly express your authentic self. And people have not been using your preferred pronouns. You humbly follow up that uh, conclusion with, I'm not an expert, but yeah, you don't say. So just like that VW, uh, sin has had an effect on us. Whether we are fully aware of our impairment or not, sometimes you have to reboot your computer, right? Memory gets full, starts to slow down. Um, sometimes you get a file corrupted, and you have to reinstall a program. Sometimes you have to reinstall the whole operating system. If things get bad, you might um, need some uh, to be rewired or have components replaced. In severe cases, God might have to give you a new motherboard to repair, to repair the damage you've done. No matter what your damage is, we are called to return to God that he might sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word. Noah Webster, that famous lexicographer, the guy that writes dictionaries, said, all the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Hmm. And yet we, uh, we don't want to go to God because this uh, world is so entertaining and there's so many, so many shiny things. I'm reminded of that Keith Green song, my, my brother uh, David Amstutz thinks in hymns, I think in Keith Green and movie quotes, um, song lyrics, you know, other. Keith Green had a song called, You Love the World. I want you. Here with me, 
But you've been keeping other company You prefer the light of your TV You love the world and you're avoiding me My word sits there upon your desk But you love your books and magazines the best These are the loves are hurting you If you end up losing me then what will you do? I gave my blood to save your life Tell me, tell me, is it right? Will you leave me here alone again tonight? It is important that we get back and spend some time with Jesus. Calibration is defined as an, the act or process of determining, checking, or rectifying the settings of a measuring instrument or other piece of precision equipment. So at, at my workplace, uh, we have some measuring and monitoring equipment that uh, needs to be calibrated regularly. Uh, we have customers in all kinds of markets, but one one important subset of customers that we serve is in the defense and aerospace uh, area. And in those industries, in, in order for us to do business with those clients, we had to acquire and maintain an aerospace certification uh, called AS9100. And that standard helps our customers ensure that their supply chain partners who are providing them services uh, are providing repeatable high quality services that conform to their needs and requirements, right? So that standard is serving a very uh, valuable role. Uh, we don't want airplanes falling out of the sky or satellites going dark, right? If that Volkswagen needs service, you take it to the shop. What do you do if a satellite needs service? It's, or, a, you know, anyway, it's a little more difficult to work on a satellite. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, I watched on the, on the TV as the space shuttle Challenger uh, exploded in the in the air over the over Florida, landed in the Atlantic Ocean in, in pieces, um, all because of an O-ring, just an insignificant uh, you know a filler part you know that joined two sections of the rocket, not uh, you know not a a primary component, but just kind of a, apparently an afterthought. And uh, because that O-ring was not manufactured to specification, um, you know, you had uh, seven people lost their lives and uh, millions of dollars in a national, you know, tragedy. <clears throat> so, the standard that we have at my workplace, uh, you know, exists for to prevent things like that. We don't make uh, O-rings, but we work on circuit boards. So. Uh, we have equipment that measures how hot things are getting, how clean a circuit board is, um, how flat is this part, you know, things like that. So uh, I've got a friend of mine, I'm going to share a story with permission uh, here. A friend of mine, uh, Doug, is a quality auditor and consultant that works with us uh, because I, I'm the de facto quality manager, which is <laughs> um, yeah, not, my, not my background, so I need help. Uh, but my friend Doug worked as a quality consultant for a company that makes uh, airplane motors. And he found when he was auditing their uh, processes that they had a problem with their calibration system. And there was a, he found a torque wrench that was out of calibration, right? So, you know, how do you fix that? Well, you calibrate the tool, right? You know, that was easy. Now we're done. We move on, right? No, it's not, not that easy. How, you have to know uh, at that point how many engines were worked on with that tool and how far out of calibration was it, right? So what they found was it was so far out of calibration that Doug said, bring me a, an engine that was worked on with this tool. And he was able to back the nut off by hand. <laughs> they grounded every plane in the world, every single plane that had that motor. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, what they were told was that if those bolts backed out or came loose, that it could uh, 
Um, it could bust a turbine and possibly send shrapnel into the cockpit, you know, injuring or, or killing the pilot and, and bringing the plane down. Uh, not a good situation. So my friend Doug was afraid that, you know, he didn't know how, how, didn't know how, he didn't know how they were going to react because a, uh, an unscrupulous company, uh, and there, you know, there are some out there, would just fire the quality team for, because they cost them so much money and uh, less ethical companies. They instead, they brought them in and recognized them and, and thanked them. So uh, anyway. So I would, uh, so when you calibrate a tool, you use a special objective standard to assess its accuracy. And for you and me, we have a calibration standard too. And that standard is, uh, is and our measuring stick is Jesus. In Acts 17, Paul told the Athenians that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath appointed. We are to be conformed to the image of Christ. He is our standard. So how long has it been since you were calibrated? What is your calibration status? There's many competing voices vying for our attention. Every one of us has to decide who we will believe from among those voices. Notice I didn't just say what, what we believe. Because you can have facts, you can believe uh, facts, and, and we all have opinions as well. But truth is not an idea, and truth is not a set of facts. Truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus also said that he was the manna that came down from heaven. So when he taught the Lord's prayer to the disciples, and he said, give us this day our daily bread, we need to commune with the Lord every day. Uh, it calibrates us. It shows us you know, where we're off. It reveals things. When you, uh, when you look into uh, you know, the law of God, when you read the word, it's like a mirror. And it shows you what you look like. It doesn't change you necessarily because it's like a mirror. You don't go to the mirror, you know, to you know, go to the mirror to fix things, right? It, it just shows you, just reveals, like shining the light. And when, sadly, many people come to Jesus, the truth, and they refuse to believe. And the, though the truth is right in, in front of them, they leave unchanged. When we're not being conformed to Christ, what... What kind of damage do we cause when we go out into the marketplace and we give bad advice and we set bad examples? When we're not calibrated against the standard, our, we drift out of tolerance. We're, uh, you might say that we're spring-loaded toward sin. <laughs> if you don't actively pursue the Lord, um, your faith will wane, your habits will get you know, sloppy, uh, temptation will come. You know, the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we are not unaware of his schemes. Let God be true and every man a liar. All right, so I did, I did tell you we'd get back to that article. Um, so I, what I, when, I read that, when I read that statement from that actress, you know, I see, I see some narcissism there. I see somebody... Um, as uh, Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire put it, uh, these ambiguous alternative identities are really a, a proliferation of narcissism. What she's really trying to say is that she's more complex and interesting than the average person. <clears throat> she's not sure who she is, but she is sure that whoever she is, she must not be what everyone else is. And when you abandon, you know, when you, when you, I see a person also that's looking for significance and meaning. And this uh, woke culture is robbing people of any sense of, of purpose other than ang anger. It's uh, anger and jealousy. It's, it's pitting uh, groups against each other. It's promoting, you know, in, in this country, uh, the critical race theory is promoting a hatred of country and a hatred between people. Um, it is nothing but uh, uh, a search for uh, meaning in you know, jealousy and, and, and class struggle and an abandonment of God and of, and of objective truth. You'll never find meaning and purpose looking within. When you abandon objective standards, uh, you cut off the branch that you were sitting on. 
you no longer have any, uh, any foundation from which to argue. Um, you no longer have, you know, who's Archimedes? Uh, was it, who said that if you give me a place to stand, I can move the earth? All right, talking about the power of, of you know, a, a lever of tools. Um, you don't have a place to stand. So a fair question that you can ask people who are making truth claims, you know, whether it's about you know something as as silly as their uh, uh, gender preference, you know which of the you know which of the hundreds of, of new gender f fluid styles there are to choose from, when someone's making a truth claim, it's okay to say who says, who told you that, where did you hear that? Because most of the time, it's coming from their imagination and their feelings. So no matter how confident a person might sound in what they say, if you invented something from your imagination or from your feelings, you're not confident. You know inside that you invented that from whole cloth out of because of the way you feel. And, the, you know, in most cases, the seeds for that type of uh, uh, statement are planted by others. Or, or possibly they're appealing to another source. Maybe someone did tell them. When you say who says, maybe they'll you know, appeal to some other uh, authority or source. Christianity, Christianity offers a far superior approach, one that is grounded in reality and moral certainty. And in an age where man's truth is subjective and changes from one second to the next, the Christian worldview offers something objective and constant and reliable. When people are their own source for truth, they're full of doubt and uncertainty. And guys, evangelism, evangelizing the world is the answer. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. You and I have got to take this gospel of the kingdom and give people hope and meaning amidst this flood of uh, Marxism and, and woke hopelessness. It's robbing people of their purpose. There's more to life than existing consciously in time and space. I don't know how you don't exist consciously. In I mean, I suppose if you're unconscious, then you're not. But do you know anybody that exists in time and space that, or that doesn't exist in time and space? I, I mean, the search for significance there is really deep. That poor lady is reaching really hard to try and grasp some significance. Um, and all she can find is... is boils down to, well, I exist. <laughs> and that's, you know, I think therefore I am. I guess that's about as much as you, basic as you can boil it down. We have the answer, guys. We have the answer to life. I'm going to fill you in on a little secret here. It's not in my notes. So I told you I might say anything because uh, I'm maybe a little loopy from uh, being awake so long this weekend. But um, I have the meaning of life. I'm going to, what I'm about to tell you is going to save you hours in the self-help section of the Christian bookstore. Uh, but I have found the meaning of life. And this is, not a, uh, this is not a joke or a punchline. But we were created to be friends of God. If you will get that, it will deliver you from all kinds of theological foolishness as well. The purpose of this whole thing from the beginning was God created beings in his image that he could have fellowship with. God desires friendship with you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life. For who? For his friends. Jesus told the disciples, henceforth I no longer call you servants or slaves, but friends. That was the purpose from the beginning. And, uh, all the great patriarchs and their faith. You know, Abraham uh, was a friend of God. Adam walked with God in the cool of the garden. God came down, had fellowship. That was always the plan. In uh, Ecclesiastes 7.29, we read, uh, Solomon wrote, This only have I observed, that God made man upright, but he has sought out many inventions. So if you, once you understand that, once you grasp that, 
um, we are to go and you know, take that message of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We're to take that message of reconciliation out. And these people who are hurting like this, this girl in her self-discovery trip, all of her hard work, that's what she came up with as a solution to her you know, uh, search for significance, that her people are using the wrong pronouns. I can't help but read her statement and also wonder why she doesn't use first person plural pronouns. Why does she say I and me instead of you know, we and us when she talks about herself? She doesn't care about her pronoun. She doesn't care if you refer to her in the plural or the singular <laughs> and that doesn't solve her, her issues. But when people understand that they were created for a purpose, they're part of a bigger picture plan and this whole time they didn't know or they suppressed that truth in unrighteousness uh, because they didn't want to deal with the implications of there being a God uh, to whom they're, you know, have accountability. Uh, so we need to tell people that instead of look, I'm going back to my notes now. All right. We need to tell people that instead of looking inward to discover your identity, the question that you should be asking is who does God say that you are? Not who do you say that you are? I mean, what qualifies you to, you know, be a, a philosopher, uh, you know, psychologist, whether it's to yourself or to somebody else. You got to have an objective standard if you're going to make judgments about yourself or anyone else. And once you've abandoned God, you're not qualified. You're no longer qualified to make judgments about yourself or anybody else because you don't have any standard. Who does God say that you are? Because that's the truth. That's a foundation, a trustworthy foundation that you can build on instead of building this sandcastle narrative on top of your subjective feelings or your lived experiences. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus promised the disciples, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come on you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When the Spirit comes upon us and fills us, it gives us boldness, it gives us utterance, uh, it gives us unction, uh, it gets us out of our you know, seats, out of our comfort zone, uh, makes us open our mouths and, and speak when, uh, you, know, maybe, you know, it takes introverts and turns them into, you know, powerful uh, orators and, uh, and public speakers, makes us bold witnesses. So we've got to draw near to God and abide in prayer, and abide in, uh, in him. So, all right, I have reached, uh, I used the big uh, large print font, and I'm at the end of my notes. So, uh, I would like to pray um, for everybody while we're here, and, uh, and just ask God, anybody that wants to be filled with the Spirit, and, uh, and get out there and take the message of hope to this generation, um, I'd ask you to, uh, to pray with me. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we all stand? Standing is a more active, more active posture. And uh, I want you to uh, just agree with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we submit ourselves to you, Lord. We acknowledge our dependence upon you. Lord, we know that you have the words of life, God. And, and despite every hard saying uh, where it seemed like sometimes you were trying to, uh, to drive people away, you know, with... Uh, uh, some of your teachings, Lord God, and some people left, Lord, uh, the, you turned to the disciples and you said, will you leave too? And Peter uh, had, had the good sense, uh, probably under the inspiration of your spirit, as, uh, as, as in other times, to say, Lord, you have the words of life, where else will we go? And Lord, we just tell you right now, you have the words of life, God. Lord, forgive us for going to other things and running to other things, Lord. When you were standing and, uh, and waiting and wanting to, uh, to share your, uh, your truth with us, Lord, to open our understanding, God, to fill us with your spirit and power. Lord, forgive us for being passive, Lord God, when, uh, when we need to be active in uh, activating our faith and stepping out, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would fill us with your spirit and power, Lord. 
Even now, God, as we're gathered in this place, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done in Life Springs Church as it is in heaven. Lord, send us out, God. Mobilize us. Activate us. Lord, the, uh, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against your people. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you that your eye is, is turned toward us, Lord Jesus, that you have not forsaken us, Lord God. And though uh, you know, the situation, Lord, in our, in our nation looks bleak, we know that you oftentimes uh, took all of the possibility of man's glory out of a situation before you moved, Lord, before you uh, came in. And, uh, Lord, the, uh, you, know, you had uh, the prophet Elijah cover the sacrifice with water, uh, make sure that it was good and soaking wet before, he, before fire came down and consumed both offerings, Lord. You, you pared down Gideon's army to, uh, you know, from 10,000 to a mere 300 men, a ridiculous, uh, out, you know, outnumbered by the enemy situation. And you did that, Lord, that no man would get the glory from your situation. You like to use the unlikely, um, Lord, who is humble and uh, submitted to your will to do awesome things, Lord God. And we ask you, Lord, to uh, take this small congregation, Lord, and turn Liberty Hill on its head, Lord, to turn Leander upside down, Lord God. Lord, uh, we pray for divine appointments right now, God, that people would come across our path, Lord, that people would bring us their problems, that we would have opportunity to speak into people's lives, to, to say to them, who said? What does God say about your life? What does God say about who you are? We may not know everything about people and, and whether we have a, you know, a, a rhema, a timely word uh, from heaven, Lord God. We know that all human beings are made in the image of God and made for a purpose, to, have, uh, to be friends of God. We know that you desire that all men should be saved and none should be lost. You take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just... Give us a burden, Lord, and, uh, and fill us with your spirit and power, God, that we could go out and be effective witnesses in our community, Lord, in our workplace, Lord, in, uh, in the grocery store, God, in our neighborhoods, in, within our families, Lord God, our immediate families, Lord, and the, the, uh, the family that we don't like to spend time with and the family that we do like to spend time with, Lord. And, uh, we've, all got, uh, we've all got some of each uh, hanging out out there. And, I pray, Lord, that you would turn our hearts to them, Lord God. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, in Jesus' name. All right. Pastor Bill. All right. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Uh, you guys go in, uh, in the blessing of the Lord this week and uh, have an awesome week. And uh, God be with you. Amen.